Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending. Additional support is provided by Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, Chelsea Lighting, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova Burns and Gian Tomasi, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, The Wickoff Group, Urban American, and Ackman Ziff Real Estate, Aerial Property Advisors, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Goldman Properties, Moynian Group, Must Development, RAL Development Services, The Spanville Group, LLC, Rosewood Realty Group, Terra CRG, Triangle Equities. So you have 19,000 employees. You have a budget over $2 billion. What am I talking about? I'm talking about probably one of the most prestigious medical centers in the country, the NYU Medical Center. And today I have the CEO and Dean of the NYU Lango Medical Center, NYU School of Medicine, Dr. Robert Grossman. Thanks for being here. Pleasure. So Bob, you know, you're, I'm a Brooklyn boy. You grew up in the Bronx. You know, tell me a little bit. Your mother met your father at the 92nd Street Y, you told me? Right, right. They uh, met before World War II, and uh, my mother uh, was, a family were illegal immigrants, and uh, so... From Romania, who ended up in Canada, right? Right, exactly. And so when they came to the United States, my mother... I think was dying to meet an American to be married to get citizenship. And she met you. Now, your dad, you said to me, went to college, uh, was an accountant, but when you were born, had uh, a variety of careers a liquor salesman, vending machine <laughs> operator. Right. Uh, Jack of many trades. Right. Uh, he had. He had. He was trying to, uh, by any way he could, make money to keep a family. He had. Uh, two kids, uh, and my uh, grandmother uh, didn't work, and so part of his obligation was to keep an extended family uh, going in the post-war period. Yeah, you grew up in the Bronx, and you were in the concourse. I mean, right. but you know, some people think of the concourse, but you were in the concourse, and as you were telling me when we got together, it, it was an interesting number of people in the family uh, living in the apartment. Right, so we had, we lived in a walk-up and we lived on the fourth floor and uh, the uh, apartment uh, contained uh, a family, myself and my brother. I slept with my uncle in a very small bedroom, poor guy, and my brother slept with my parents and my grandmother slept in another room and when uh, the other part, members of the family stayed with us. They slept in the living room. So it was a little crowded. And then, and then you said that uh, then things got a little better and you moved to Mount Vernon, right? Uh, we moved to Mount Vernon in 1954. And in Mount Vernon, 54, you went to public school. Went to and, public school. And the interesting situation that you told me is you had no idea 
about phys medicine. You had no idea about school. You really didn't go to school. It wasn't something that was built in there in your heritage or anything. You know, school wasn't there. Right. Uh, I, I think um, there was not a lot of attention paid to school, education, um, what it meant to go to college. The assumption was, well, if you, um, if you want to go to college, that's fine, and you could go to city college, uh, and, which, would be, which would have been perfectly fine. But there, there just wasn't a focus on education at that time. Now, but there was something, you know, maybe because we were contemporaries, there was always something maybe in our genes that they, they, they put physicians in a certain pedestal or, you know, maybe later on in your life, one of your mentors was like a Ben Casey, as we remember. <laughs> but, you know, physicians were put into a category that if you were a doctor, you, you were financially successful, you were a member of the community. What was that? Yeah, so I, I think uh, I, actually uh, nobody in my family understood what it meant to be a physician, uh, but they did uh, put the uh, the doctor on a pedestal, and, and they uh, looked up to the physician in the community as well as the physician as a significant breadwinner, and of course. Uh, at that time, there was total fee for service, if you will, and uh, I think my parents aspired uh, for their children to be physicians. Now, the the interesting thing that you were saying to me, you know, when you were going to when going to public school, you were, you had a, a variety of odd jobs. You, you worked, you had a paper route, uh, uh, you worked in delicatessen, I believe. Uh, and then I think the, 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 job, the job that really made you make a decision that you wanted to get an education was the summer job uh, pushing, peeling paint at the Sea mm -hmm. Isle. Uh, Glen Island Glen Casino, Island. right. Uh, well, I had, uh, uh, as you said, a number of uh, jobs, including work at cleaning the walls of a butcher shop and sweeping the floor in a butcher shop. And, uh, but the Glen Island Casino, was a job I had uh, after my senior year of high school. And I remember uh, having scraping the paint off the Glen Island Casino one summer. And, and after a day, my body was covered with all the, <laughs> the scrapings and it was in my hair. And uh, I remember thinking to myself, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? And, and that was, now, the interesting situation is you you really never left Mount Vernon or the Bronx. You, I mean, you had a limited growing up environment, and and you, as you said to me, you really weren't a good student. You were a good student, but you didn't study. You never looked at anything. And the big question was, how did the kid, the Bronx boy who lived in Mount Vernon, end up in Tulane? Because um, well, you had never been on a plane. Never been on a plane. Uh, it, it was a very good student, but I didn't, um, there were no aspirations of where necessarily to go to school. And I remember one day opening up uh, a college guide, uh, not thinking about anything, and Tulane <laughs> popped up. And I thought, gee, New Orleans? Why not? And, and that was about as insightful a, a, as I uh, had been. And uh, it, I had never been on a plane, so the, uh, my first trip on a plane was my trip to college alone. Now, in addition to being alone, it was a different thing. You had never gone to the campus before. So when you, know, when you end up in Tulane, you are alone. You had never seen it. You had never been in that part of the South. It was a, it was a, it was a new environment. It was something different. It, it gave you, and, and then you said to me, <clears throat> it also gave you the feeling that, hey, I might as well study now, right? What happened? Right, well, I thought um, this was my uh, one opportunity. This was it, I'm in college, and all of a sudden. Otherwise, you'd be pulling the paint <laughs> at the, uh, the, <laughs> the casino. The right, and I thought, um, you know, I have to really apply myself that uh, there are a lot of intelligent kids there. You just couldn't get by uh, with going to class and not opening a book. And 
so I, I thought, okay, uh, I had to learn how to study because I never knew how to study. A and I had to uh, uh, learn also uh, how to manage my time and do the things that I wanted to do. And I uh, was very focused on trying actually to get an education. Now, how did you decide on pre-med? Well, I, th <laughs> I, I don't know exactly how, how I decided. I thought I wanted to be a, a physician, and um, then you have to, if you want to be a physician, the natural course, although today I probably would say you should do whatever you want to do um, and take the pre-med requirements, but the natural course then was to be pre-med, and probably half the freshman class at that time was pre-med because part of it uh, was uh, the uh, issue and the proximity of being drafted to go to Vietnam so there were many more. So it was, it was better to was continue better to, to, to have a graduation. Now you stayed your summer there to take more courses right? and then at the, the end of the second year you had a, an opportunity to go to Europe. Tell me about that because I think that was something that really changed you and provided you insight around the world and fortunately the Euro and everything else Gave you right. a little scholarship, as one would say. Uh, a lot of scholarship. Um, but so I uh, had accumulated uh, enough courses that I could have gone to medical school instead of doing a third year. And I thought about it. Um, but then for some reason, I thought, why not try to uh, take an opportunity and uh, apply and go for the junior year abroad program, which was unusual at that time for universities in, in 1966, 1967, to ha really have a uh, well thought out junior year abroad program. And so uh, I applied and got accepted to University College London. And uh, it really opened up my eyes, both in terms of a much broader liberal arts education, because I took art. Uh, and, and many other courses that I wouldn't necessarily have had an opportunity to take. And at the same time, I got to travel uh, all around Europe. And, 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 that, and that was due to? Uh, well, the, in 1967, Britain devalued the pound, and all my scholarships were denominated in dollars. So the dollars all of a sudden increased in, in value, and it was uh, quite in, in a... So, it was, so besides getting a... Uh, of learning the arts and every other field, you were able to take some of the money and go traveling. Exactly, and, and ha actually have more fun than I would have e ever an anticipated, and um, and actually get to meet a a and spend time with a uh, different culture. So then you, f so it's a year abroad, and then you go back to Tulane, and what happens there? Uh, then I applied to medical school and. Um, get accepted to University of Pennsylvania. Uh, also on a scholarship. Also on scholarship. Now, but at University of Pennsylvania, your initial thoughts, you know, when you were going there is that you wanted to be a uh, surgeon. Right. I thought I wanted to be a neurosurgeon because in, in England, I had spent a significant amount of time studying neurophysiology. And I thought, um, well, the natural extent, clinical extension would be would be neurosurgery. And I was very excited about the prospect of uh, being a neurosurgeon. And, and probably in the back of my mind, I thought, uh, wow, Ben Casey. Uh, of course, neurosurgery wasn't exactly Ben Casey either. Um, but that was my initial focus when I went to medical school. So you graduate University of Pennsylvania, and you go for residency up in Boston. Correct. I, um, I started out in a surgery residency, and uh, then uh, I spent a year doing surgery. Then I came back to University of Pennsylvania and did two additional years in neurosurgery. With somebody who became the provost, who you considered like a Ben Casey, right, correct? Right, right. Was he was truly a Ben Casey figure and, and a great guy and a wonderful uh, mentor. Uh, his name was Tom Langfeth. And he, um, I was very happy to be going into a uh, neurosurgery uh, residency in 
uh, a, a, under his direction, and then he became the provost, uh, which uh, gave him a little less time to focus on, on neurosurgery. So, ne and then this was the time at the beginning of CT scans, uh, even before MRIs, because when you, as you were saying, and as I read, there were mammographies, all of this. Then one day you see this image, right? This image. So I got. So I went to. Um, a, a meeting in Boston, and they showed some of the very early CT images of the brain, and uh, they were stunning. And they were a cross-sectional image, which was the first time that was ever done. And it was profoundly powerful in terms of its diagnostic accuracy. And I remember, even though by today's standards, very crude images, and I came back and I said to my wife, this was probably in April of uh, 1976, uh, uh, probably. Uh, no, no, I mean, 73, 74, 75. Um, and I said to my wife uh, that all the advances uh, in neurosurgery are going to take place through imaging, and I'm going to switch fields and uh, go into radiology. A and um, I remember, I, I think I mentioned to you, I told my father, <laughs> called my father up. Now, you have to understand that my parents felt uh, as proud as proud can be that their son was going to be a neurosurgeon. Right? And so I said to I remember calling uh, my father up and saying, well, you know, I'm switching fields and going into radiology. And there was dead silence on the phone. And uh, then he said, well, let me get this straight. You're giving up brain surgery to take pictures? So you finish, you give up brain surgery to take pictures, and, and then you continue because your wife, who was a... Uh, an ophthalmologist uh, an eye with a specialty in cornea, uh, was training at the Willis uh, Eye Hospital in, in Pennsylvania. Then you continue, you decide to continue on in neuroradiology. Right, so um, we then move up to Boston, to, and I was at the Mass General, and Elizabeth was uh, at the Mass Eye and Ear, and we spent two years there, and she did a cornea fellowship, and I did a neuroradiology fellowship. And then back to... And then, uh, actually, I followed my wife back to Philadelphia because she, it was hard for her to get a job, and she got a, uh, an excellent job on the cornea service at, at Will's Eye Hospital, and then I got a job at University of Pennsylvania. Now, you had more than a job over there. I mean, during the, the period of of uh, close to um, 20 years uh, at University of Pennsylvania, you, you excelled and you were vice chairman of the Department of Radiology. And some of the major work that you've done over the years, and, and then you, in, I think, 1999, you got the Javits Award, is that you've been involved with stroke and uh, MS. Tell me a little bit about that. Right. So um, my work basically involved uh, using uh, imaging and particularly magnetic resonance to understand uh, pathophysiology uh, of particular uh, neurological disorders, be them stroke, uh, multiple sclerosis, and also head trauma. Those were my three key areas. And, and it turned out that uh, through a variety of techniques, some of which uh, we developed, myself and, and uh, colleagues, uh, we were able to offer some insights in, in, into those diseases. So now it's, it's 2001. You have a good job, good situation at, at the University of Pennsylvania. And then you have this really good medical center who really was in transition. And they had a, a chairman uh, retiring from radiology. And they find this guy by the name of Grossman. What happens? Well, um, I was delighted that they uh, found me, and I came up and I uh, looked at a a NYU, and I thought uh, there was tremendous potential a a at the institution, although um, the radiology department needed some work, and um, 
but I thought that, that uh, there were a lot of positive elements that would be. Now, one of the major th accomplishments that uh, we discussed was bringing, you know, people want to be in the best city in the, uh, in the world, New York City, best for education, best for medicine, and companies want to be there, technical companies. And you s figured out a way that Siemens, the German company, wanted to make NYU a showcase. Right. So um, the, in radiology, uh, much of radiology is dependent on the type of equipment uh, you have. A and uh, at that time, it was very equipment uh, specific. And so the question was how to leverage being in the heart of New York City uh, and in, at the same time enable the department to uh, acquire all the imaging equipment it needed and then to be able to attract first class researchers and clinicians. And what we did, uh, and this was uh, with the help of Bob Glickman, the dean, and Ken Langone, uh, we, did, we asked for bids for a single vendor for all the imaging equipment. And, and I like the idea of single vendor for a number of reasons. First of all, it provided us leverage, uh, but also all the equipment worked the same way, basically. So it, it, it uh, was uh, much easier to train people uh, and the consistency of what you got was much better. And so in the end, uh, we made a, a excellent deal with Siemens uh, for a, 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 as a single vendor and that worked out great for Siemens and it worked out great for NYU. And it became a center of excellence for them, center of excellence for you, and a financial center over there. So now it's 2006 and you know uh, Dr. Glickman uh, re is retiring and here's a guy who really didn't have a business background, you know, who made, who did a great business deal with Siemens, and they say, hey, it's time that we're going to come out and look for a new dean. What happens? Um, well, I was called one day, I, I believe it was in July, and I was asked if I wanted to be in considered for the uh, dean search, and I thought about it for a day, and I said, why not? <laughs> uh, but I never aspired to be a dean or CEO. It wasn't, I, I was very focused on what I was doing all the time. So, but what happens is it was 166 candidates, then it's down, and then it's down to two, and, and then you're, you're selected the CEO and dean. And in 19, you know, and there has been so much that's happened over the past five years, um, and it's an interesting situation, and people can read it. Uh, when you, the investiture uh, in, 2007, uh, you said, I'm an, as a dean, I'm an enabler. I enable people. And you made five specific comments that you wanted to take care of over that period of time. You want to speak about those? Well, I thought um, we had to run the hospital, uh, it, the medical center, as a medical center, not as a school and a hospital. And that was really uh, critically important. Um, we had to uh, invest in ourselves and our people and um, build up uh, the institution, and that meant building a, a new hospital. Uh, we needed new facilities for our students. We had to embrace uh, science and uh, demand a lot of accountability through, throughout the entire institution. And one of the important things which you've accomplished is you wanted to integrate the School of Medicine and the Medical Center. And that hasn't been integrated in many places. And I think in your discussion, in your investor, you, you said, look, take a place like the Cleveland Clinic, take a place like the Mayo Clinic. They have invested and affiliated with the medical school. Here we have a medical school at that time, 167 years age, now 172 years, that you were able to do that. Correct. So, well, I think, it, uh, first of all, the position of Dean CEO is a pretty unique position. Most places have a hospital president uh, and a dean or a CEO and a dean, and they operate that interface between the hospital and the school uh, many times as course. Uh, 
uh, and so I had an advantage in terms of the structure and, and then uh, to use that advantage to really uh, create por porosity between the hospital and, and the school and uh, we used many tactics to be able to do that but at the end of the day uh, we created uh, this organization that is incredibly agile at decision making. A and that's one of the things uh, I think that was quite enabling in terms of how, how uh, we move forward. Now I think also, you know, as you said, you weren't a fundraiser, but fortunately, you know, being built over the years, uh, the university in the medical center had put together some really good trustees. I mean, one, <laughs> one, you know, one, one great one, Ken Langone, who you know, was involved with the university originally and then in 1999 made his first major contribution and then made a second contribution over there. But, you know, taking people like him, Larry Fink, Druckmeyer, I mean, the Kimmos, the, these people. And what you said in in 2007 is we're going to have to spend a, a lot of money and we're going to have to raise a lot of money. And you raised like $2.8 billion? Well, no, I raised actually $1.2 billion. Right, but it's on the roll. On a roll. On a roll to, to, to raise, to raise $2.8, exactly. $2.8 billion. And, and some of the, the projects that are going to build there, I mean, the hospital, which was built in the 50s, it needs a little work. The, right. you know, so so what, what we're going to do, um, so the Tisch Hospital, uh, which uh, the Tisch family uh, ha has been extraordinarily generous to the institution, uh, we are, are, are in the process of renovating and we're going to continue to renovate. Uh, and at the end of our renovation, it'll be essentially a new hospital. We're building, in addition, a, a, an 800,000 uh, square foot Kimmel Pavilion with the Hassenfeld. With, with inside of that will be uh, a children's hospital, the Hassenfeld Children's Hospital. We're building a 400,000 square foot research building. Uh, and uh, we've taken uh, 250,000 square feet of space in another building, which was a Verizon building to build a, a, an ambulatory center. 135,000 uh, square feet to build our musculoskeletal center, which opened up. Uh, another 100 plus thousand square feet uh, for our dry research uh, center. Where are you relocating Rusk to? So Rusk uh, is going to be the Rusk is going to be the uh, hospital building is going to be demolished, and uh, much of the uh, uh, of rusk work is ambulatory work. Right, so, so it's going to so be that's part of the musculoskeletal center and on 38th Street in our new building. And the inpatient uh, is going to be relocated at uh, the Hospital for Joint Disease. So, I, I mean, ov over the years, I, I mean, you've done a lot. L l quickly, you have two sons? I have two sons. And one of them is a Hedge, hedge fund, fund manager, right? A hedge fund manager in Chicago, and one of them is a uh, does mergers and acquisitions at Jones Day. So uh, I'd say you know over the years, you know, for the, the kid who grew up in the concourse in Mount Vernon, one would have never expected you to be where you are, and, and you are driving uh, the driving force behind probably one of the finest university medical centers in the country, and I'm happy you're here today. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure.